How's it going, everyone? And welcome to the Manuscript Podcast. This is the podcast where we believe 21st century man controls his destiny, that his choices define his future, and that he writes the script to his own freaking life. I'm your host and fellow man, Ruben Stamper, and as always, it is an honor, a pleasure, and a privilege to have you here with me today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you get something out of this episode, consider subscribing. So before we get into things, I gotta clear, clear the air, get the elephant out of the room, as they say. You may have noticed that the past two weeks, I did not have any manuscript podcast episodes coming out. I know, it saddens me as well, but the truth is, I've been incredibly busy. And um, my wife and I are trying to save for a house, get a, down, a nice down payment on a house. Uh, and that requires a lot of work. You know, we're both very young. And so, um, yeah, basically, you can either bitch and complain about how the economy is and why you can't get a house. Or you can go do something about it, which is something I'll be talking about later on in this episode. Uh, but so, just to be clear on that, I'm going to have to drop down the frequency to doing one episode every two weeks. It saddens me. I love doing this, but this is, at the end of the day, of the day a, uh, a passion project. And so if it's taking up too much time from actually doing things that contribute to the overall well-being of my family, then I have to let it go by the wayside for a little while. So uh, last week, I could not upload this episode because I didn't have the SD card for uh, my audio. So I, I had lost it, but I found it, and so we're back on track. Um, but I just wanted to give you all a quick update. Every other week, there will be an episode of the Manuscript Podcast. I just had to get away from doing it every single week because it, it takes out a giant chunk of every weekend, and I need that time to do more work. So, anyways, work that I get paid for, right? <laughs> uh, so, anyways, without further ado, let's get into the first segment of this week's Manuscript Podcast episode, where we're talking all about contentment. Let's go. Contentment. The art of being okay with where you're at. Looking towards the future and hoping for a brighter future, but also being able to rest in the moment that you're in and say, okay, I'm very grateful for what I have, and I'm happy for where I'm at. It's a skill. It's a skill that I think we all have to learn. I'm still trying to learn this myself. Uh, if you find yourself being an ambitious man, which I think is a good thing, you know, you find yourself looking towards the future, and that's a good thing to do. I think planning is a wise and mature thing to do. Uh, but if that planning for the future comes at the cost of actually being happy in the present, then I think you're doing it wrong. And so I want to talk in this segment of the Manuscript Podcast about contentment and why I think every man should try and, and uh, really work on, on being content with where they're at. You know, and no matter where you're at, you just got out of prison. You know, like learn to be content with, okay, you know, things aren't perfect right now. I'm working towards a better life. Uh, but I need to be content in the, in the place that I'm at right now, okay? Like, regardless of where you're at in life, learning to be content is a skill that really, uh, first off, keeps you away from really stupid decisions, you know, like, I don't know, maybe you're up unhappy with the amount of money you're making, and so you irrationally go out and you buy a business you know nothing about with a giant loan, and then two years down the road, you're pulling out your hair saying, why the hell did I do that? Well, Maybe if you'd have been content in that moment, you wouldn't have made that decision. And so um, contentment is, is a key to actually just being able to rest where you're at. And, and also it gives you a great uh, ability to see the future in a wise manner, right? Because if you're constantly worried about what's going to happen tomorrow and, and what's going to happen the day after that and, and trying to make life better and, oh, th things will just be perfect once I hit this milestone. The grass is always greener on the other side. Uh, it's not true. It's not true. A lot of times you need to be able to Settle in where you're at and be grateful for what you have in that moment. Now, I'm not saying whatsoever that you should stop aspiring to, for greatness down the road and, and becoming better than you are right now. I think that's an a ongoing journey throughout every man's life for the rest of their life is this idea of, yeah, I want to become better. But but don't let that come at the, the cost of your, uh, your happiness and, and your joy around other people in this moment. Work to become better, but also be grateful for where you're at where you've gotten to, uh, and, and the things that you have in your life. So <clears throat> anyway, I want to give you a couple reasons when I think contentment is such an, a, a crucial uh, tool in a man's toolkit, basically, uh, for happiness. Because once again, this whole podcast is centered around becoming the happiest man you can be and becoming the best man you can be. Uh, so first off, I've been very clear. I'm not afraid to talk about emotions on this show, but I think your emotional well-being is is something that really benefits from contentment because it's easy to be a gripe or to be to be like Eeyore from 
uh, Winnie the Pooh all the time if you're never happy with where you're at. And I'm sure you know people in your life, right now you can name them, who are just constantly complaining about where they're at and never take time to just step back and say, oh, wow, I've really, I've got this going for me. I've got this going for me. Uh, this area of my life is getting a lot better. You know, maybe I'm improving here. I'm improving there. Um, and, you know, these people just never take that step back to, to make those claims. And instead, they're always saying, wow, life is shitty. It sucks. I've got, you know, this shitty thing's happening to me and that shitty thing's happening to me. And I can just never get ahead and I'm never, never moving forward. And, uh, Sometimes it can feel like that, right? Sometimes you feel like you're stuck. But the truth of the matter is, a lot of times there are a lot of good things around you that you can actually take some solace in and say, oh, okay, things aren't as bad as as I think they are. And I need to learn to actually be grateful with where I'm at. So on that note, you know, it it does help you with gratitude. And gratitude uh, is this idea that basically uh, you have an attitude of attitude of gratitude, an attitude of, of looking out at the world. And instead of, tr- of choosing to see the things you don't have, you choose to see the things you do have and to uh, be grateful for them, to, to step back and say, oh, you know, whatever it is, it's, I've got a good family life. A lot of people don't have that, you know, and I take that for granted all the time. Or, uh, you know, my wife is amazing, you know, it's like, and I, and I take her for granted all the time and, and I, I shouldn't do that, you know. So this idea of, of fostering gratitude in your life, it's going to just make you happier overall. Uh, and contentment really does include gratitude. So you have to be able to be grateful for the things you have in order to be content with where you are at. Uh, And then the third thing I want to talk about is contentment is just like pivotal for healthy relationships, right? Because, you know, my wife and I, we've got a bunch of goals we're trying to achieve right now. Uh, But if either of us, you know, on on either end of the spectrum were to just not be able to have a, a certain level of contentment, then the other person would always feel like, oh, I guess I'm, you know, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. And it's like, no, like that's that's um, it's bad for relationships, in my opinion, right? Because it's very good for a relationship to say, hey, listen, I have these dreams and these adventures I want to go on that I want you to come along with me for, you know. But I'm also okay with where we're at. I'm I'm happy with where we're at. And that's once again, this is not me saying don't be ambitious and don't strive for greatness. Absolutely do that. But also, don't let that you know, don't have that mindset for 40 years and then look back and be like, what the hell did I do with my life? I was just constantly waiting for the next thing instead of actually being able to settle in and, and enjoy the moment, smell the roses, as they say. Um, and so if you want healthy relationships, you have to, to foster this, this spirit of contentment basically in your life because if you don't, you're going you're gonna to seem ungrateful to other people. And you're never going to be able to actually build something great with someone else, right? Whether that's your wife, whether that's your best buddy, whatever. You, you can't be complaining all the time about life. You have to, at a certain point, uh, be willing to, to be content where you're at. Um, and then, so another thing that's, I, I think, pretty, pretty self-explanatory, but you're going to have major reduced levels of stress if you can actually learn to, to exhale and say, oh, life's not that bad. I've got a lot going for me. I should just choose to be happier right now in this moment where I'm at, you know, uh, and, and to recognize that life is always changing. So the, the odds that it will get better if you're in a bad place are incredibly high, as long as you're willing to actually make choices that will make it better. Um, but yeah, I, I think that people get stressed all the time worrying about things way down the road in the future that sometimes we don't even have control over instead of actually, once again, taking that step back, taking that pause and saying, oh, okay, it's a good life. It's a good life. Just those words right there. Like, you know, I I try and say that to myself uh, pretty, pretty regularly. Like, it's a good life. You know, like the life I lead, I am genuinely happy. uh, And I've got a lot of work to do on myself. I've got a lot of work to do in a lot of areas of my life. Uh, But overall, it's a very good life. And I think that having that attitude, it it opens a lot of... um, channels of thought because otherwise you're closing things off and you're saying, Oh, there's all this shit coming at me all the time. And, and I just, if I just had another $10,000, I'd be happier or whatever it is. And it's like, well, if you actually get those thoughts out of your mind and you start thinking, Oh, I'm really happy with where I'm at. All I can really do is go up from here. Like everything's just going to get better from here. Then all of a sudden you start seeing things you never would have thought of before. So, uh, anyways, that's a, that's a bit of a tangent, but I wanted to bring it back to, yeah, it reduces your stress levels. Um, and then, kind of on on what I just said, it's going to increase your productivity overall, because when you're content with where you're at, 
you you see things differently. You have this abundance mindset, right? Where you're like, oh, okay, the sky is blue everywhere. I just need to I just need to run for it. I need to go for it. You know, like the grass isn't greener on the other side. I'm gonna work on on growing the grass on my side of the hill. Okay, like this is this is where I'm at. I'm gonna choose to make life as great as I possibly can uh, with where I'm at. And so that that idea of contentment it actually allows you to be more productive because you're not bitching and complaining all the time. You're actually going out and doing things because you recognize, oh, okay, life's good here, but there's a lot of different doors I can take. You know, having this positive mindset in, in, in that regard of there's a lot of doors I can take. Um, I'm not closed off. I'm not being oppressed by a thousand different forces. You know, I can make these choices that will, that will uh, steer my life to an even better spot, but I'm going to be grateful for where I'm at right now while also understanding that life life will get better in the future and that that uh, idea of contentment, it also it kind of breeds hope in your life, okay? And hope is incredibly important if you're going to try and achieve anything big in your life. So anyways, in conclusion, learn contentment as a man. It will make you to a happier man. It'll make you uh, more enjoyable to be around because someone who's not content and is constantly saying, well, if I just had this thing, if I just had that thing, if I won the lottery, life would be great. It's like, no, no, life will be great when you choose to accept that life is pretty good overall. All right, that, that's contentment. So anyways, I digress. That's all I have to say on contentment. Hope you enjoyed the first section of this podcast. Let's move on to section two of the Manuscript Podcast. Let's go. All right, everyone. So in this section of the Manuscript Podcast, we're going to be talking about a rather optimistic and happy uh, article regarding charitable giving in the United States. I thought it was pretty interesting. I wanted to share it with you all. So this is from an article on reninc.com by Carla Comstock, who is a strategic growth advisor over there. According to this article, while age has become less predictive of charitable giving trends, overtime and household income has proven to be more telling. It's still worth noting the percentage of those who participated in charitable giving in 2022 by age group. So it's two years ago, but still relatively fresh data. So 40% of Gen Z who are 18 to 25 years old contributed uh, to charitable giving. 53% of millennials, 26 to 41 years old, contributed to charitable giving. 54% of Gen Xers, 57% of boomers, and 63% of seniors. So it seems like the older you get, the more you give, which I, I guess makes sense. You have probably more uh, discretionary income. You can just do what you will with it, and hopefully you give some of that because generosity is, is a good thing. Um, so the major takeaway from all this is that every generation is pretty damn generous. That's that's great. That's actually really good news to hear. It makes you feel good about humanity uh, writ large, you know? Um, and so you may be asking, why why am I talking about this in a, a podcast all centered around men becoming happy? Well, I think it's important for every generation, you know, whatever age you are watching this, whether you're a millennial or Gen Z or boomer, maybe you watch YouTube if you're a boomer. I don't know. Um, but whatever generation you're in, it's always good to kind of keep a general eye. I'm not saying become obsessed with this data and, and stuff like that, but a, a general pulse on what your generation is doing well and what they need to improve on. So it's like maybe Gen Z, you know, their their opinion or their their views towards old people are incredibly derogatory. It's like, okay, how do I fix that? You know, I see the numbers. I see maybe okay, maybe the they're they're just like they hate old people. I don't know. Maybe that's maybe that's a thing. I, I actually don't know the numbers on that. This is just an example. Um, if that's the case, well, okay, what can you do about it? If you're a Gen Zer, what can you do about it? You can control the one thing you can control, which is you and your actions. So maybe you start to choose to look at older people as as uh, valuable sources of information and full of wisdom. And maybe you disagree with some of their outlooks on life. That's okay. But you can still choose to see them as valuable members of society. And so... The point I'm trying to make is it's important as men to have a general idea of where we may be failing as a generation and where we may be excelling. And if we're excelling, we'll keep excelling in that area. But if we are falling behind, you know, then we should do better. So like if your generation were giving, you know, if 10% of them contributed to charitable giving, it's like, well, damn, the other 90% are just, I mean, is that just, they don't give anything, you know, and, and this is not a preachy thing at all. This, this is it's never my place or any man's place. So you need to give more money. That's that's not uh, our job. I think in general, generosity is a very good thing. And I think that everyone from a philosophical level should participate in it because it actually, it benefits you just as much as it benefits the person you are, you know, giving to. Um, 
But yeah, I don't know. I thought this was a pretty, pretty optimistic outlook. It's like, oh, every generation, for the most part, I think Gen Z, uh, yeah, I was at 40% of Gen Zers who are 18 to 25 years old. So that's my generation, um, contributes to charitable giving. 40%, okay, I get it. Economy's a little, little tight. People probably aren't spending as much money on charitable giving because they don't have as much discretionary income. Uh, I think that, personally, this is my personal opinion, I think everyone should be giving in some manner or another, whether it's time or money. Um, but, but you know, it's like, okay, that 40% is still pretty damn good for people that are that young, still just at the budding, the beginning of their careers, you know? So, overall, this is a pretty optimistic article. It's saying that America... And, and, it, and its majority is a very generous country. And we like to give to causes we care about. And uh, generosity is a good thing. So anyways, I wanted to share that with you all. I thought that was really interesting. And uh, I hope you enjoyed that little report there. All right, everyone. So I'm going to get into very hot water for this take and for this rant. But screw it. It's going to be a fun rant. It's one that I'm incredibly passionate about because I don't like messages of hopelessness. And there is a message going around, specifically in my generation, which I'm technically a Gen Zer that you can't buy a house as a Gen Zer. It's never going to happen. You're going to have to wait till you're 45 to ever afford a house, and by then the house prices will go up, and you'll never be able to afford one. It's over. This message is bullshit, and it is a hopeless message. And if you watch this podcast, I I'm not into hopeless messages. The whole point of this podcast is 21st century man can make choices to define his future, to change the outcome of his life, and to change the, the things he can achieve. And so... When I hear all these, all these people saying, oh, you can't get a house, I understand where they're coming from. I want to give you all some facts real fast. Mortgage rates are higher. They are. And you put that into a mortgage calculator, and you're like, 7%, man, that really sucks. Every month, it's popping out whatever that number is, and you're looking at it, and you're like, oh, it'd be so much higher than if it were 2%. That is true. That is true. Housing prices have risen. They have exponentially, specifically after COVID. It's true. Houses have gotten really expensive. They've always been expensive in relation to people's income, but particularly now, they have got expensive, which stinks. And another fact, you can't get the same exact house you would have wanted for the price you could have 10 years ago. But that's not a huge surprise because houses always go up in price. They always go up in value unless something really terrible happens, your foundation blows out or something like that. But overall, as a trend, real estate goes up in value. And it has since its inception, really. So, um, those are the facts on the shitty end of the spectrum. And I understand why people get fired up about that. And they say, well, you'll never be able to get a house. I understand because that sucks. All those facts suck. I wish they were not the way they were. But they are. So, here are some more facts. Life is full of adjusted expectations. Like I said earlier in this podcast, contentment is a key to living a happy life. Uh, but that's not to say you can't make choices in your life that will change it. Here are a couple options that I have just written down. There's five here that are just tips and, and tricks and things I've thought about for how to afford a house in today's economy. Now, there's a message that just in general, you can't get a house. The truth is there are still very affordable houses out there but they're not what you're looking for. And so I think from the get-go saying you can't get a house. No, you could. The average person probably could, but it's not going to be the house you want. It's going to need a lot of tender love and care, or it's going to be on a street corner, or it's going to be next to a busy highway, and maybe it's not the right amount of rooms and baths you want, and this or that, but you could do it. You could do it, okay? So that's not a very hopeful thing. You guys are probably at this point saying, well, Ruben, that's just a scummy thing to say. I, I, I mean, duh, you could get it. But like, are we never going to be able to afford the house that we want? No, I don't think that's true either. I don't think that's true either. Um, my wife and I, one of our big goals recently has been to try and get a very nice down payment on a house. I'm happy to share that with you all. It's one of the reasons I've not been, been able to do this podcast as much is because I'm working a shit ton because I've got to make extra money to have a really nice down payment so I can have a mortgage that I can afford. Because that's the thing that's killing people, right? Is this idea, well, you're going to take away 40% of what I take home each month in my mortgage. I, I just can't do that. That's crazy. Um, and I get it. I do. And you, and you shouldn't do that. But what does that mean? It means a sprint. It means, and it's not a marathon. It means a sprint of saving a shit ton of money to try and put down on a house, okay? And to get a really nice 
a, a really solid mortgage that you can afford uh, and hopefully pay off your house fast or whatever, but, but you, that you can afford that's not going to cripple you and make your house poor. Uh, but that requires a lot of hard work and saving a lot of money. And that's difficult, right? It means like right now we're living like we make 20K a year, okay? Like that's, we are living very, very poor, very below our means, but that's because we recognize there's a sprint we're trying to make as a couple to, to get into a house because statistically over time, uh, owning a house is one of the keys to becoming wealthy. So here's my, here's my list of tips that I want to give you all. And at the end of the day, it's going to be hard because things that are worth attaining are, are often hard. They're very, they're often difficult. Okay. And so it's going to take some sacrifice because all things that are worth getting take sacrifice. Um, so here's the five things I want to talk about. Number one, adjust your expectation to know that affording a house may take a couple years of small sacrifice, right? That's just the first tip is you need to adjust your expectation because sure, things aren't the way they used to be, but life is constantly changing and your expectations have to change with it. That's the whole idea of contentment I talked about before. Be content with where you're at and be willing to kind of change your outlook on, on how things are going to be, right? You're like, I wish I could get into a house next year, but maybe you can't afford it. So it's like, okay, but I know that three years down the road, if I save up enough money, I can get into a house with a big enough down payment to have a nice mortgage. Um, step number two, create a budget and stick to it and don't blow money left and right. Because you can bitch and complain all day about house prices and mortgage rates. And I get it. I feel the pain because I'm right there with you. And it sucks. And I hate it. But it is what it is. And you have absolutely no control over it. You can't. You can try and vote for people who will, do, who will try and influence people to, to make the right choices with rates and things like that. You can do all that. But it's not happening anytime soon. It's going to take a little while, okay? And so we are where we're at. And admitting that and accepting reality is a huge part of living a happy life, right? Because you can wish all day, I wish mortgage rates were down at 1.99%. And I wish the average house was, you know, $175,000. You know, I do too. I do too. But that is not where we're at. Um, so you have to, for a short time, you should always have a budget, but you need to have a strict budget and stick to it and be willing to understand that this is a sprint. It's not the rest of your life. It's a, it's a, you know, two to six year period of your life where you're just trying to stash as much cash as you can to have a nice down payment on a house. Um, okay, so that's that's the second step that I, I wanted to rant about. Third thing, adjust expectations on the house you want. So here's one of the things that sucks. Like, okay, well, if you want to get into a house earlier, guess what? Your expectations for what you thought you were going to get versus what you might actually get, there might be a divide there. So Maybe uh, you get something that does need a lot of work done to it, but you know, you'll get your house and you won't be uh, beholden to the landlord who's going to raise rents every single year. You know, Maybe it's on a corner lot. You didn't want that. Maybe you wanted a three-bedroom, two-bath, but you got a two-bedroom, one-bath. Okay. All right. So do you want this? Do you want it bad enough? And are you willing to adjust your expectations to get on that path of, of being able to you know, get a house and then pay off your mortgage, and then jump to a nicer house down the road because that's, that's what happens for the most part. That's, that's the path a lot of people take. <clears throat> so adjust the expectations on the house you want. There are houses in my area that <clears throat> go for $165,000. And, you know, the average income is like $74,000 in America for the household income. Uh, and it's like, okay, $165,000, $175,000 house, um, yeah, you can afford that with that, with that income. That's true. But guess what? They're not the prettiest houses and a lot of them need some tender love and care. And some of them are on corner lots and some of them are next to busy highways. And, uh, where my wife and I stand is we don't want that house. That's not a house we're looking at. So, okay. What does that mean? We have to save more money because the houses we want, you know, that we are interested in where location wise and state of just the, the overall condition of the house, they cost more. And so you have to adjust just things on that on that uh, front. Okay, the fourth tip, which I've been talking about earlier, but I, I'd like to reiterate, is that save up a bigger down payment. You know, now it's easier said than done. Trust me. I mean, we are sacrificing pretty damn hard right now because it's what we have to do. Because, <coughs> um, 
I mean, I, I, I am in the budding part of my career. I am not like a fully developed 35-year-old guy down the road who's making 125 k Like, that's not where I'm at at all. So I've got a couple other skills on the side that I can do. I'm good at remodeling, so I can do things like that and do side jobs and bring in that extra income through gigs like that. It requires time and sacrifice and time away from my wife, and that's sad, but that is where we're at. That is where we're at, okay? Uh, and so you just have to stare at reality in the face and say, this is what we have to do. Um, if we want to get to this place, if this is something we both agree, agree on that we really care about, that means a lot to us, then this is what we have to do uh, in the meantime. So yeah, saving up a, a bigger down payment for your house is one way to alleviate that terrible mortgage fear, right? It's like, if you put down a very nice down payment, well, that brings down your mortgage significantly. And so then all of a sudden you're like, oh, I, I can't afford $3,000 a month. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. You know, it's like, okay, but if I, if I save for another year and a half and put X amount of money on it now, it's like, okay, I brought it down to, you know, 1400 a month. And that's much more manageable with your income or whatever it is, you know? And so saving that big down payment is one of the ways you can drop that mortgage rate. This is just a tactical thing you can actually do. Um, and then also if the rates change, if they do drop, which who knows, economists say this or that, you never know what's going to happen. If they do drop, you can refinance and then you've got a better, better mortgage. Okay. Um, and then the fifth one is stop pissing and moaning, make a plan, stick to it. Don't deviate, recognize that it is a sprint and just sacrifice for a little bit of time. Okay. Like everyone, it's so easy. This is what makes me mad. It's so easy for everyone to just jump on the bandwagon of bad news. You can't afford a house. It sucks. Like, you know, the market out there is just rough. I mean, you're never going to be able to afford a house. So you're like 32. It's so easy to say that, man. It's like there's no resistance. Why? Because that's what everybody wants to hear. They're like, oh, yeah, well, that makes it that makes a lot of sense for why I can't afford a house. Because everybody is saying that it's really sh a shitty market and I can't do it. I'm sorry, guys. I don't know if you can tell. I, I get pretty fired up about this because... <clears throat> I'm not of that mindset at all. Like I, I just used to look at the facts and you say, yes, it is expensive. Like, yeah, it's hard to get a house and it may not be exactly what you want, but you can do it. You can do it. You could literally scream all day and all night into the face of mortgage rates and house prices, but they aren't going to do a damn thing. Only person that can change the outcome of what happens with you in a house is you. You got to get out there and, and make some freaking money. Do something about it. Get a nice down payment. Put it on a house. Get the mortgage down. Pay off the mortgage. What do you like? Just make a plan and stick to it instead of just screaming all day at how bad the economy is. I get it. I'm not saying that it's not a valid point, but I am saying what is a, a bad message to give people is just one of hopelessness. It, you know, a lot of people making you know the the median uh, household income in America. You know, a lot of the people out there they they don't think they can get a house. And it feels good to drag other people down and say, well, you can't get a house either because I can't get a house. They, they, they like to believe that if they can't do it, well, then nobody else can. It's like, that's bullshit. I do not ascribe to that message. I never will because <laughs> it's a stupid message. You can. I'm here to tell you, you can. Like, it may take you four years of saving, six years of saving. But if you, if you set a budget and you sprint and you just work your ass off, Guess what? One day you're going to find yourself in a house that is actually pretty nice. That is in an area that you, you know, may not be your top choice, but it's still a pretty damn good area. And then over time, you pay off that house and you can move with the equity in that house. You can go to a nicer house, a better house, an area you really love and a type of house you really enjoy. And that's all because you took the time early on in your life or even mid midway through your life, whatever the time is, to just say, screw it. I am not going to go along with the narrative and the message. I am going to actually go out of my way and work my ass off and sacrifice for a short period of time, short period of my life, because five years in the scheme of your life is a blip. It'll be gone like that, you know? And uh, yeah, you, you got to sacrifice for a little bit of time so that you can achieve the goals you want to achieve. And if one of those is getting a house, well, it's a big sacrifice, but I think it's worth it. You have to ask yourself that. Is it worth it? If it's not worth it to you, fine. But stop telling everybody they can't do it because they can. You're just choosing not to, okay? So anyways, that's all I had to say on houses and buying a house in today's economy. And it just that, that hopeless message that everyone seems to be spewing from their mouths these days is that, oh, our generation is effed, man. There's nothing you can do. So stupid.
So stupid. I'm, I'm done with it. So anyways, that's all I have to say on house prices, getting yourself a house. If that's something you want to do, go do it, man. I have hope and I, ha I have faith in you. You can do this. You can do this. So anyways, that is the end of the Ruben Rant segment. I hope you enjoyed. All right, everyone. That about does it for this episode of the Manuscript Podcast. Thank you so much for watching. If you got something out of this episode, please consider subscribing. It would mean the world to me. Uh, have yourself a great day. As always, remember, there's a better life out there. Let's get after it. Peace.